Okay, so today I want to talk about uh, edge detection in a little bit more detail. Right, so so far we kind of danced around this um, idea. We talked about it a little bit for sure. Um, so in addition to kind of like this low-level image processing stuff that we've been talking about so far, things like geometric operations, changing the shape of an image, or histogram operations, changing the colors of all the pixels of an image, now I want to start talking about a little bit more on the road to image understanding, right? So if I take an image, how can I kind of try to see what's going on in that image in the same way that a human would, right? And so this is kind of like the first step, going from the low-level stuff to the medium-level stuff we talked about before. And so we talked about certain spatial 2D filters that do edge detection. So these should be familiar from our previous lectures and our homeworks, right? So we talked about the Sobel operators. So these guys are going to detect edges that are going in the horizontal and vertical directions, respectively. And we also talked about, you know, in one homework, you, you started to think about what would we do if we wanted to design a Sobel-like operator to detect edges at different angles, right? So we talked about, for example, what you might have done would be something like this, right? Where maybe we wanted to detect edges that are going at a 45 degree angle, you know, we could kind of make a, a filter like this. And you can imagine that you could make filters that are larger to detect edges at finer <coughs> angles, right? So if I gave you a five by five filter, maybe I could detect angles that were like at 30 or 60 degrees or something like that. We're gonna talk about that a little bit here. So I wanna come back to, first of all, what is the, you know, underlying motivation for why filters like this work, okay? And so that means that we need to think about what is an edge in an image, right? So if I have an ideal edge, right, that means that I have some sort of a transition from one intensity to another intensity. So if this is kind of, say we're looking at edges in the x direction, and this is intensity, we have this kind of ideal step edge, okay? In practice, we may not have edges that are quite like that, and say we might have something that looks like a ramp edge, where maybe I have one intensity and then I kind of slowly ramp up to the other intensity, okay? And so we can think about, okay, well, what would the derivative of this function look like, right? So in here, um, if we take the first derivative, well, like we know from signals, the first derivative of a step function is just a delta function, right? And here, since this guy is more slow, this has basically got a slope of zero here, slope of zero here, and slope of some positive constant here. So this, the first derivative of this guy is gonna look something like this. And so this suggests that places where the first derivative is really large can be used to detect the presence of edges, right? And we've kind of already started to think about that concept a little bit. We're going to develop that more a little bit today. Um, the second derivative, right? So, I mean, here we haven't really defined what the derivative of a delta function is. We could think about the second derivative over on the right-hand side. So here, if I was to look for places where the first derivative was large, what I would get would be basically a you know, a whole series of responses right across this ramp edge, right? Whereas really what I want to do is I want to isolate the middle point of that edge, for example. And so the second derivative could help me do that. The second derivative of this guy, again, I'm going to have a delta function like this and a delta function like that, right? So I'm going to have a place where there's a big positive number and a big negative number. And what I could do is I could look for basically the middle point of where the sign changes, right? And so kind of the intuition is that, um, you know, the first derivative, what I could do is look for big uh, absolute values. And the second derivative, I could look for sign changes in the second derivative, which are also sometimes called zero crossings.
Okay. So those are both different ways of looking at the problem. And there are some issues, right, with um, taking derivatives and images. So one issue is that in practice, edges are not going to look like this in real life, right? In real life, maybe I'll have something that is not an actual ramp, but is more like um, something that is kind of like a noisy, you know, increase from one grade level to the other grade level. Okay. So the problem with taking, um, you know, if, if I call this f of x, the problem with taking derivatives is that taking the derivative is going to amplify the noise. So the ampl the noise is going to suddenly become a lot more when I take the derivative. So if I take, for example, here, I'm going to have a low value in general, a low value in general here, and then I'm going to have an increasing derivative. So my derivative is probably going to look something like this. And if I were to take another derivative, I would have even more noise. So maybe I would have something that looks like um, looks like this, right? Where I have a positive derivative this way, it flattens out, that's where the zero crossing is, and then I have a negative derivative this way, okay? So the key issue I'm trying to illustrate here is that noise is amplified. And that can sometimes make it harder to find the places where the first derivative is big or places where the second derivative crosses the zero axis, the zero line. And so one solution is to kind of low pass filter the image first, to avoid the noise, right? And in some sense, that's exactly what these Sobel filters are doing, right? Because if I think about this guy, right, this guy looks like a filter that looks like it's a difference operator in one direction and a smoothing operator in the other direction. So really what the Sobel filter is doing is taking the difference in one way to find the edges in this direction and smoothing the image in this way to reduce noise. And since we know that these two operators, you know, the smoothing and the, and, well, since these are both like successive linear operators, I can apply them in any order. So I can think about this as smoothing the image first and then finding direction, finding edges in the other direction, right? As opposed to just a more simple edge operator. So let me say that a little more precisely. So. Really, what I want to emphasize today is that edge detection is related fundamentally to derivatives, okay? So, um, edge detection is fundamentally related to the gradient of an image. Which is nothing more than the x and y derivatives. Right? So sometimes, if you remember calculus, you will see this notation, like the del, or the derivative of f, or the gradient of f, which is the same thing as you know, putting the derivatives of a function inside a vector. And then sometimes they may call this like gx, gy. And so there are different ways of approximating these derivatives, right? And so the easiest one is to say, okay, the difference in the x direction is like saying, okay, I'm going to take a little step in x, keep y the same, and subtract from where I am now, and the derivative in y direction could be the same kind of thing. This is only one such approximation of the derivative, but it's a handy one, okay? And the idea is that just like with a function, this 2D vector points in the direction of the highest rate of change of the function, right? That's why we, that's why we cared about derivatives in calculus was that they showed us where was the function changing the most. And so if I were to think about an image and think about where is the gradient, it would look something like this. So I could say, okay, my image may have an edge that goes from dark to light, 
like this. And if I were to center my question on this pixel and I were to ask, okay, so where does the derivative point? Well, the gradient is going to point basically, so if I have dark values going to light values, then the gradient will point in the direction perpendicular to the edge, right? Because it's saying that if I start here, which direction should I go to change my intensity the fastest, right? And naturally, you can do is just step across the edge. So basically, the gradient points perpendicular to the edge. And the edge direction is more like this. OK. Now, like we said, often we want to look at, for example, the magnitude of the first derivative. right? So what is the magnitude of the first derivative? It is the uh, length of that vector. Right, so I can write it like this. And the angle of that gradient should tell us something about the angle of the edge. And so the angle, which I'm going to call alpha here, is basically the inverse tangent of this vector. And so let's take a look at you know what that gives us for, for a given image. OK, so here in MATLAB, I have an image like this guy. OK, so this image has lots of edges in it. And I'm going to turn it into a grayscale image. OK, so the first thing I can do is I can make some simple gradient operators, right? And so I could say, OK, my gradient operator in the x direction is going to say, uh, take a look at the difference between me and my neighbor in one direction. And the uh, so here I'm going to kind of be thinking about, I guess, Cartesian coordinates, so x being the usual, the usual direction of x. And then y, I'm going to make the opposite. And then I can filter my image with these guys, to which order this goes in. Make sure this is the right size. No, I did it the wrong way. Because I want the image to be filtered and have the same size as the original. OK. And then my GY is going to be the filter of this guy. And now I should be able to, for example, um, look at the gradient. And so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the magnitude of the gradient. And let's see what that looks like. So here, kind of hard to see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a different color map, see if that helps. So here what I'm going to see is the original image and the edge image. And so kind of, I'm going to, to move this over a little bit. So kind of what we're looking at is that blue means not much edge action. And then as I increase you know, up to red, that's where the strong edges are. And you can see that you know, most of the image is blue, meaning there's not a lot of edge activity. But if I were to zoom in on places where there are strong uh, left to right lines, I should see some action, right? So for example, if I zoom in here, this is where I start to get some pixels that are in the yellows and greens and reds, right? And so if I wanted to threshold this image to say, okay, show me all the edges that are greater than, say, um, 80, I would hope to see something that was a little bit more edgy. So I could say something like im show the places where the gradient of x is greater than 80. And let's see what we got. So here, you know, Actually, it's not that exciting. Maybe I should turn down my threshold a little bit. Show me places where that's greater than 40, let's say. 
So here I start to kind of pick out some edges. It's kind of hard to tell, I think, because my image is bigger than this screen is kind of subsampling. So if I were to kind of zoom in on this, here you can kind of see I'm starting to pick up some of these edges along the left-hand side. So one of the things we're going to talk about uh, in the next lecture actually has to do with, you know, how would I connect these edges up together? So say I wanted to find the outline of this box. We'll talk about, in the next lecture, things like edge linking to be able to draw boundaries around things. So hold that thought until we get to the next lecture. And the same way I should be able to do uh, the gradient of y. So if I were to look at um, the gradient of y, just looking at the absolute value of it. And color map jet again. So now this guy should basically, let's see if I can make this a little bit better here. Invalid handle. Okay, so this guy should basically have uh, strong edges where there are, you know, a lot of up and down activity. And again, you can kind of start to see that in these regions, right? A little bit here, for example. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, well, you know, I, I kind of expected these edges to stand out a little bit more, right? And that's a good point. So what can we do to make this look a little bit better? Well, one thing is that my edge operator is pretty crude, right? So what if instead of using the uh, simple, you know, one minus one operators I used, what if I use a better edge operator? So here, instead, I'm going to say, okay, what if my hx is, so let's recall what I had. Instead of using this, what I'm going to use is my Sobel operator. And then my HY is going to be just that thing transpose. And now I'm going to rebuild my gradients. And now I'm going to look at these guys again. Let's put these side by side. Okay, <laughs> clearly I did something wrong there, so let's close that guy up. So what happened there? Uh, oh, I guess because I didn't do the absolute value like this. Yes, yeah, better. Okay, I feel better about this, so let me do another guy here. So now I have stronger x edges and y edges, right? So if I were to look, for example, down over here, I would see that you know there's a little bit more, you know, clear activity, for example, telling me there's a left to right, you know, there's a vertical edge, right? And the same way here, this guy is more strongly picking up this up and down edge or horizontal edge, right? So there's a little more hope that if I were to threshold this guy, I would get what I wanted. And the same way, I've been kind of implicitly using this abs, right? So abs is basically the same thing as, um, well, let, let's make this magnitude map, actually. So maybe what I should do is say my magnitude map is going to be the square root of the gradient in x and the gradient in y. And my angle is going to be the arctangent of the gx over gy. And I'm going to multiply that by uh, 180 over pi to get degrees. And so now, if I were to look at the magnitude, this should basically give me places where both the x and y edges are high. And if I were to do the angle, Okay, so here, kind of what I'm looking at is on the left-hand side is the magnitude of the edge map. Again, this is basically going to have you know non-blue values whenever there is some sort of edge activity going on, right? And so here, I can definitely see that things are basically outlining the key objects that I care about. And you know, there's a bunch of crud over here that is you know maybe a little bit edgy. And so we'll talk about how we can fix that stuff, uh, you know, in, in coming lectures. 
Here what we have is the orientation of the edge. Okay? A little bit harder to interpret, and it looks pretty noisy. Part of the reason is that in places where there isn't any edge activity, that angle is not going to really mean anything. So it's almost going to be like just a random number in places where you're just looking at you know, a, flat, uh, a flat region. So stuff like this doesn't really matter. But here you can see that this is the angle. And so when I'm at 0, I should have a greenish edge, right? which is what I'm seeing for all these strong edge pixels over here. Right, like so. Here's where I get all these green guys. When I'm at a strong uh, horizontal edge, I should either get kind of a red or a blue because of the way this color bar wraps around. So I can see that that's what's going on here. And then I could also see that I could imagine I could pick out edge orientations like here. This edge of the triangle is all showing me this about 30 degree number. And similarly, on this other side of the triangle, oops, sorry, all these guys are also roughly at the negative 30 degrees, right? So if I wanted to, I could say, make an edge operator that picks out only those things. So for example, what I could say is uh, the following. So give me an image such that the absolute value of the angle minus 30 is less than 10 degrees. So I want things that are close to um, 10 degrees. Or I'm, I'm sorry, I want close things that are close to 30 degrees. And I want places where the magnitude is greater than, say, uh, 20. Let's see what that number gives us. OK. Clearly, I didn't do what I wanted. So what did I do wrong? Maybe my maybe my magnitude. What is my scale of my m here? Oh, it's pretty big. Okay, so then my my threshold here is pretty poor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really look like what I want. Let's try be a little bit less aggressive. So these things where this worked at home, why doesn't it work here? Yeah, okay, so what's going wrong here? So I want my A to be within a certain value. Hmm. Yeah, I think that, would, that should have worked in my opinion. So what am I doing wrong here? Let's try and tweak this around. The absolute value is not covering the end. The absolute value is? It's covering the bus. Oh, huh. So wait a second. Yes, I want this, right? Absolute value of a minus 3 less than 10. Mm. OK. Let's write this from scratch. I want the absolute value of the difference between a and 30 to be less than 10. Put parentheses around that. And I want the magnitude to be greater than 200. Hey, all right, this is getting better. All right, so here I can see that I picked out those edge pixels, right? So I wanted to make a preferential edge operator that was only detecting edges at a certain angle. I could do that. And if I used if I used plus 30 instead, I should get the other side of the triangle. Yep. OK, sorry about that. Right, so you could imagine making preferential edge operators to say, OK, I only care about edges at a certain angle. Um, and so even though I built all this stuff by myself, because I'm a MATLAB master, you can also use these built-in functions. There's a function called imgradientxy that gives you the x and y gradients. And you can see here that it, I believe, by default, is going to use the Sobel operators, just like I did, for some extra smoothing. right? But it gives you some additional operators if you want to use those instead. And there's also a command called imgradient that gives you the magnitude and direction of the edges straight out. Right? So you don't have to use this arctangent, whatever, yourself. You can use these built-in functions. Okay. Okay, 
So let me stop and ask any questions about this. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so I think what to conclude what I just said in uh, MATLAB is that um, you know we can do things like we find places where the magnitude. I guess this m is already a magnitude. We could say that I want this to be greater than some threshold. This will tell me only strong edge pixels. Or I could say I want to find places where the angle, the absolute value of this, is within some threshold and the magnitude is greater than some other threshold. That's why I just did to find those edges. And so that kind of thing you can do with these you know, gradient operators. So I want to mention a couple other edge detecting operators that are commonly used in literature. So Sobel is very common, so that's, that's the most often used one. But there are a couple other ones to know about. So one is called the Laplacian of Gaussian. Which is also known as the Mar Hildreth detector after a couple of guys, also known as the Mexican hat filter. And so the idea is that, you know, sometimes what we want is an edge detector. So one of the issues with the Sobel detector, right, is that it only really applies to finding edges that are on the same scale as these pixels, right? So for example, you know, here, I'm only looking at a three by three pixel neighborhood to make my edge decision, right? Whereas oftentimes what I want to do is I want to find, okay, maybe I care about really broad, high, uh, what's, what's the right word? Like really strong edges that are, for example, like the edge between this monitor and the wall, right? That no matter how much I blur the image, I would still see that edge coming through. Versus edges like the little checks on my shirt that are like more like pixel level details, right? So if I blurred the image, I wouldn't see those checks anymore. So there's kind of this idea of scale dependent edge detection. And that's what the Laplacian Gaussian function will help us out with. So the idea is uh, an edge detector that can be tuned to edges at different scales. And so the idea is that you know large operators, which correspond to kind of big spatial masks, so big operators correspond to very large scale or you know big blurry edges, whereas small operators will respond to fine scale you know. Okay, and so the definition of the Laplacian Gaussian is literally what it sounds like. So basically, if I have a Gaussian filter, which we talked about last time also, right? So a Gaussian filter would be something like this, where I say, okay, I've got a Gaussian. And this sigma controls how wide my Gaussian is, right? If sigma is small, this thing is really pointy. If sigma is big, it's really spread out, right? And so again, what we were kind of getting at with the Sobel operators was that sometimes it's a good idea to smooth the image before we find edges. And the same way here, what we're doing is we're smoothing the image at some scale, and then my Laplacian operator finds edges of the image after the smoothing, right? So if I were to take the double derivative like this, right? The definition of that would just be, well, if I can take these derivatives of the calculus. I'm not going to actually do the derivatives for you here, but I will tell you what the answer is. 
it turns out to be the Gaussian multiplied by another function. So the result of this is that I get a function that looks like the following. So for some reason, I don't know why we always look at the negative of this function. I guess because it makes more sense. So it turns out that I have a function that looks kind of like this. And as you'll see for a second, if I rotate this around, it looks like a sombrero, which is why they call it the Mexican hat. So the idea is that the characteristic of it is that it's big in the middle, it dips down to be you know, slightly negative on the sides, and it goes to zero on the outside. And the width of this guy here is 2 square root of 2 sigma. And so the idea is that depending on how I choose my sigma, it depends on how spread out this sombrero peak is. Okay. And so if we look at this in 2D, so MATLAB allows us to uh, make such a function. I mean, I could make it by myself, but I mean, if I look at uh, F special, which I think you may have used, whoops, that's not a word, which I think you may have used to, to find a Gaussian in the first place. So besides Gaussian, one of them is log, Laplacian of Gaussian, right? And so here, what I can ask for is a Laplacian of Gaussian. I specify the filter size. I specify the sigma. And so just to make it really clear, let's look at a really big filter. Let's look at like a 101 by 101 filter with variance of, let's say, 10. OK, so I'm going to think about this as a surface. But well, let's just look at this for a second. All right. And I'm going to plot the negative of this just because it's conventional. And I'm going to make a nice color. OK. So here, you can see that this is why they call it the Mexican hat filter, because you know it's big in the middle, and it dips down like a sombrero a little bit, right? And then it levels out at zero, OK? If I look at it from the top, I've got big values in the middle, slightly negative values in this ring, and then it zeroes out. And then depending on what my sigma is, I can make this filter sharper or uh, broader. And so for example, if I was to use a different sigma, so say I was to use a smaller sigma, then this would be a much narrower Mexican hat. Right? And if I used a bigger sigma, I would get a much broader Mexican hat. So let's say like this. Here, the Mexican hat is so broad that you don't even really see the, the dipping down to zero part of it inside this range. right? So it's probably almost too, too big to be useful. Okay. And so again, what is the theory? The theory is that we are um, is the Gaussian part smooths the image down to a certain scale. Right? So if I apply a big variance to the Gaussian, the image is going to get really fuzzy, right? And then the Laplacian. finds the edges at that scale. Right? And since this is a second derivative operator, we look for the zero crossings of the Laplacian Gaussian. So we look for zero crossings. since it's like a second derivative.
right? So kind of one way to think about this is that my gradient image is like, you know, I can either think about it like the Laplacian of Gaussian operator applied to the image, or I can think about it as the Laplacian of a Gaussian operator applied to an image, right? Because everything is linear, I can move around these convolutions without penalty, right? So here, this is like saying, okay, first I smooth the image, then I find the edges, right? That's, that's, that's really what's happening. And so, like I just showed you, MATLAB has this F special LOG function built into it. Okay. And so let's see. I guess I should have thought about this before I um, came here, but let's let's see what we get when I filter the image with certain LOGs, right? So let's start with my um, my small LOG, and then make a slightly bigger LOG. I'm not sure what we're going to see here, so I have no guarantees this is going to look great. But let's see. So what I can do is I can filter my image with the small guy first, and then the big guy. <coughs> and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to find. Well, let's, let's just take a look at what these what these things look like. So. Um, So kind of what you're seeing here is that you know the left hand side is filtering with the small scale elegy, the right hand side is filtering with the large scale elegy, right? And again, either uh, I guess I should think about what the color map is here. So basically, um, let's just put a color bar on one of these guys. So these are going to basically go from positive to negative values, right? And so Anything that is kind of far away from green means big value. So kind of what I'm looking for is places where there is a zero crossing from blue to red, right? And so here you can see that this guy is picking up lower detail edges, like the rings around the eyes of this mailbox or this doorbell, right? So here, you know, these are going to be nice strong responses here. Whereas as I filter this more, I'm going to get Bigger scale edges, like you know, the difference between. I think a probably better example is like the the things on this nose, right? So here, these guys here are all being picked up as important edges at a small scale. After I blur the image, those little holes on the speaker have been blurred away. Those don't get picked up in the higher dimensional, you know, the higher size LOG. But things like this big mouth in the mailbox that are going to be significant at any blur scale are going to show up, you know, more and more. So kind of you're going to get responses to strong edges at you know, multiple scales, right? So for example, here, these edges are really only significant at the small scale. These edges around the mouth are significant at the small scales, the medium scales, and the large scales, right? So in some sense, what we want to do is, and this is a little bit outside of the topic of this lecture, what we might like to do is say, okay, at what scale is this edge most important, right? So that gives us a sense of you know, where are the biggest edges. That kind of notion of scale space maximization. We could talk about that a little bit more maybe after exam two. That's more of a computer vision topic. Kind of what I want to get at though is that, you know, here I'm finding lots of little low detail edges and here I'm finding only the highest edges and the low detail edges in this guy are smoothed out. And so this would be useful, for example, if you really cared about understanding, okay, I don't care about all the nitpicky, you know, texture in my shirt. I only care about finding the big edges of the objects in the world, right? I don't want to get confused by small scale edges, right? So if I was wearing a black and white patterned shirt that had strong edges in it, but I wanted to really find the boundaries of these black and white monitors against the white wall, in that case, I would probably want to do a, you know, filtering, a big smoothing of my image to get this part to go away and that part to show up more strongly, right? So it's kind of, that's why we use the LOG is, is to make this kind of scale space stand out. So 
the idea is that um, you know could also find the uh, scale by which I mean sigma um, at which a given edge is most significant and then filter on that. if you wanted to. So just one comment on the LOG, right? So the LOG is, you know, fine. Um, but also there's something called the difference of Gaussians. So we can approximate the LOG with a difference of Gaussians. Sometimes also called DOG. So that definition basically is exactly what it sounds like. So what I could do is I could say, okay, I'm going to take a Gaussian with one variance. And I'm going to subtract a Gaussian with another variance. And it turns out that you can make these DOG operators look a lot like the Mexican hat. So for example, let me just show you why that's true. Um, so again, I can look at my F special, and I'm going to make two Gaussian operators. And let's say... Um, So let's again make these like reasonably big. And so here's a Gaussian that has a big variance, and here's a Gaussian that has a smaller variance. And so if I look at the first Gaussian, let's yeah, so close these guys up here. So here's one Gaussian, okay. And let me just make this a little bit smaller. And if I look at my other Gaussian, it has a smaller variance, right? And if I look at the difference between those things, so I'm going to subtract these two things, what I get is something that is actually pretty much, I'm going to make the negative of this, you know, something that kind of already pretty much resembles the Mexican hat I had before, right? And so the idea is that by carefully choosing the sigma 1 and sigma 2, I can make something that looks almost like the Laplacian Gaussian. And it turns out that for computational reasons, sometimes we like to do this because there are reasons why we want to filter the Gauss filter the image with Gaussian filters of different sizes. And so it's like saying, okay, well, if we've already got these different levels of Gaussian filtering, I can subtract them and I can get these LOG operators kind of for free, right, without having, having to actually compute the LOG. So that's more of a computational thing, but it's certainly used a lot in computer vision. So I'm going to say this is used a lot in computer vision. So for example, if you've ever heard of the SIFT algorithm, we're going to maybe talk a little bit about this after the exam too. This is a super popular algorithm for automatically finding good features in an image, like nice corners and blobs in an image. And so this DOG is a critical part of that image processing uh, computer vision pipeline, as it turns out. So we may talk about that a little bit more later. Okay, so questions or comments about LOG? All right, the other major uh, edge operator that you're going to see is called the Kami edge detector. So um, I just want to say a couple words about that. And as I'm, as I'm talking, let me just show you that in MATLAB, you know, there is this edge command, right? And it basically goes through all the stuff I'm telling you about right now. So you can find edges in the image with kind of whatever you want. Sobel operator, LOG operator. What I'm going to tell you right now is this canny operator, right? And so fundamentally, you know, you can read more about all the details of how it works 
inside this documentation. I just want to tell you about what's kind of under the hood of this one called Canny, because that one you're going to see a lot in terms of people who write an academic paper and they say, well, we applied the Canny edge detector to blah, blah, blah. Right? So let's talk about what that actually means. OK. So this is, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole grungy details of this method because there are a lot of little implementation details. But I'll give you the, the high picture. So the basic steps are the following. So first we smooth the image with a Gaussian filter. Next, we compute the gradient magnitude and orientation. Okay. The next step is to do what's called uh, non-maximal suppression. And let me just explain what that means in a separate slide. So we're going to do this process to obtain a new gradient image. which I'm going to call GNXY. OK, so first let me explain what this non-maximal suppression is. OK, so the idea is that when I have a non-ideal edge, right, if I have like a ramp edge instead of a step edge, so suppose I've got a ramp edge that goes up like this, right? So I've got no action, then I have, you know, some intensities, and then I work my way up to intensity 75, right? So if I look at the magnitude of the gradient here, so here I've only got one dimension. So here, what I'm going to have is the difference between me and my previous guy. So it's got 0, 0, 0, 10, 15, 25, 15, 10, 0, 0, 0, right? So if I'm looking for the edge center, really what I care about is this pixel here, right? I want to know where is kind of the center of this edge. But if I'm thresholding on the magnitudes of the gradient, these guys here may be kind of non-trivial edge responses. So this here is the center, but these guys here may be kind of non-trivial magnitudes. And so what I want to do is I want to suppress those guys and not include them in my edge map, because I really only care about the middle of these edges. Okay, so what does this mean, non-maximal suppression? So what it means is the following. So the idea is to quantize this angle of the edge into four bins. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say here is my possible circle of Be a crappy drawing. It was okay. So okay. So basically, I'm going to say that everything here has been one, been two, been three, been four. Okay. So every edge has both a magnitude and an orientation. And so if I look at my magnitude at a given pixel and my angle at a given pixel. So let's kind of draw a little sketch like, like this here. So let's suppose these are edge magnitudes. I'm just making up numbers here. And these are the corresponding bins of the edge orientation. So kind of the idea here is saying, OK, you know, there's a strong edge in the middle pixel, which I guess I could have drawn better. And it's going in this direction, OK? So basically, I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to look at this pixel. And this is its direction. And I'm going to use that direction to look at my local neighbors in the corresponding direction. Right? So this is saying, I think the edge is going this way, so I'm going to look at my neighbor above me and below me, and I'm going to ask, am I you know, greater than both of my neighbors? If I am, I'm going to stay in. 
If I'm not, I'm going to throw it out. So basically, if this guy is greater than uh, both its neighbors in the quantized edge direction, you know, then I'm going to keep it in this new map. Otherwise, I'm going to not keep it. Okay. So the idea is, all I'm doing is I'm kind of keeping points that are locally bigger than my neighbors in the estimated direction of the edge. Okay. So this results in some new binary image. Or maybe I should say, I'm going to keep it, um, I think it's probably better to say I'm going to keep it with the magnitude. Otherwise, I zero it out. Right, so now I'm basically, basically going to have something that either it's going to be the same as the magnitude or it's going to get zeroed out because it's been suppressed. Right, that's what non maximal suppression means. And then what I'm going to do to detect the final canny edges is the following. So the last step of canny is to detect and link edges. And so the idea is that I build a high map that says, find me all the places where this magnitude is greater than some value. So these guys are going to be like the really strong edges, the places where the magnitude is really high. And then I'm going to make a low map that says edges that are not quite as strong. So these are going to be weaker edges. And then the final map is going to be all the strong edges along with um, all um, edges in the weaker map that are maybe should, all edge pixels in here that are adjacent to at least one pixel of the strong map. So basically the idea is saying, OK, I'm going to assign two thresholds. The guys that are really strong, those are all in, right? The guys that are somewhat strong, I'm not going to include them all. I'm only going to include the ones that are close to a strong edge. Right? And the idea here is that you know, this notion of including some but not all of the weak edges helps me kind of bridge some gaps that I might otherwise have missed. Right? So typically, you know, this low threshold, or maybe the high threshold, is maybe two times or three times the low threshold. Right? So the, the high threshold is pretty high. The low threshold is a lot lower. And the idea is that you know this guy here may have some gaps. These guys here may clean up some of the gaps. I'm not going to include everything, just the ones that may help me bridge the gaps. And so the visual consequence is that canny edge maps seem a lot cleaner than other edge maps. And so if I just show you an example with the doorbell again. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, my edge map is edge of the image and use the canny edge detector. Uh, fail. So, okay, so on the first glance, this doesn't look so great. And probably the probably problem is that the canny edge detector has some parameters that tell me how my how my threshold should work, right? So here I can supply fresh, and fresh is gonna be, I believe, the high threshold, if I don't say anything else. So fresh is a two element vector. If you supply a scalar, this is used for the high threshold, right? So let's suppose that I look to see what was the automatically chosen um, threshold that yeah. 
So if you don't say anything, MATLAB will just choose some threshold for you. Sometimes it will be good, sometimes it won't. So here it's saying that the low threshold is 0.05, the high threshold is 0.14. When I look at that image, I see that the image has like lots of um, distracting edges, right? Too many. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify instead, I want you to use 0.4 as the, as the high threshold. Okay, that means that there is a stronger criterion for getting in as an edge in the first place. And when I look at that edge image, uh, I guess I have to look at it like this. When I look at that edge image, well, things are definitely a lot, you know, a lot less clutter, right? Maybe I went too far. Right, so here, one characteristic of canny edge maps, though, is that they do seem to have like long, continuous strings of edges, right? And that's useful for what we're going to talk about on Thursday, which is basically how can I link edges together into boundaries of objects? And so, you know, here, for example, you might imagine that I could follow this octagon basically like all the way around, and I don't get distracted by all the other kind of low, weak edges that are inside the periphery of this area, right? So the nice, the nice thing is that, for example, actually, this is pretty good, right? So here, I could follow all the way around this mouth of this mailbox with the canny edge detector, whereas if I was to look at the corresponding thing with Sobel, just look, let's look at that as an example. So uh, Right, so kind of let's look at the comparison. So in general, you know, the canny edge map looks much, much cleaner than the Sobel edge map does, right? Because the Sobel edge map is picking up all sorts of crud that's just in the background of the image, which are probably not going to get classified by canny as being strong enough to include, right? So that's why here there are some gaps that, you know, Sobel doesn't have, but there's also like a lot of other crud that Sobel does have, right? So the nice thing about canning is you get these kind of edge maps that look like kind of what you want. And um, let's see if I can give you, actually, let's just see if I can make this even a little bit better. So here, I feel like my canning was still a little bit uh, conservative. So let's make a little bit more um, like this. And then let's look at this guy. So kind of on the left is canny with a high threshold, on the right is canny with a low threshold. Um, you know, actually I think I made the right choice with the threshold that I did because, you know, if I kind of compare here, I can see I'm including more kind of random stuff, right? So again, none of this edge detecting stuff is just like a turnkey solution where you just apply the default MATLAB parameters and it works. You do have to do some manual tweaking to find out what edges are going to work for a certain kind of situation, right? And so for example, you know, obviously, you want to incorporate these things into some sort of hopefully automatic algorithm. Um, but what you would do is, you know, say that you were looking at parts coming down a conveyor belt, right? You've got a camera, you've got some sort of lighting, you know that stuff is probably not going to change. And so what you would do is you would say, okay, I want to find the edges of these parts. I'm going to look at a whole bunch of images and I'm going to tune my canny edge detector to give the parameters I think are going to work right for my situation. And then I'm going to hard code those into my algorithm and forget about it, right? But I wouldn't just use the default parameters and hope for the best, you know, in any sort of real application. You have to kind of actually work with it a little bit. Um, so let's just see. Um, oops. I'm not sure if I have any other good edgy images here. Uh, so. Let's try ceiling or corner. Oops. Back. I don't think I could be wrong. Well, let's just see if edge detection works with color images. All right. So here's an example that has like some definitely strong color images um, or color edges. And I'm not sure whether if I just say this, it will work. 
So we have to turn this into a grayscale image. As we do. What? Oh, I guess I return into this. Okay, so here's the grayscale version, and now I'm going to make an edge image. I haven't tried this before, so who knows what it's going to look like. Uh, well, you know, let's see what we got. I mean, again, part of this is just a resolution issue, so if I were to zoom in on these regions, maybe it would look a little bit better. So here you can see that you know, I'm actually getting pretty nice, you know, continuous edges in this image. If I were to look kind of in these guys here, you know, a little bit harder. I'm, you know, I'm not expecting to get much out of these paving stones here. But you could imagine that if I wanted to use this to, for example, find the doors and find the windows, this is looking a lot more like what you would get a human to do if you asked them to trace the edges in the image, right? So again, there's lots of clutter that's making edge, you know, making object detection in this image going to be a little bit more of a challenging thing. But, you know, I mean, I think that this is, you know, not too bad. And if I wanted to be a little more aggressive, so let's see, for example, what what did Kenny choose as its thresholds? So here it made some different automatic choice of thresholds. And so say I want to be more aggressive about my edges, and say I'm going to choose, um, you know, 0.4. Well, I don't. Know. Let's see. Okay, so now I'm definitely getting much fewer edges, right? So, for example, if I look at the um, if I look at the cobblestone area, I'm not picking up any of that stuff anymore, but I am picking up like, oops, maybe I should be a little more. I am picking up basically the edges of the doorway. So suppose I was looking to find doors, right? Doors and windows. You know, here, I did a pretty good job outlining just the most important stuff, right? And actually, you can see that even though there were lots of edges over here before, now the planty edges have all gotten kind of abstracted out for the most part. And so again, I could toy around with these parameters to get something that looks as much like, you know, a good edge image as I want. But it's not a, you know, it's not an exact science, right? There's definitely some manual tweaking around to get what you want. Um, so yes, upshot is that on the plus side, canny, edge, canny image edges often look more like what you want eventually. The downside is that the algorithm is more complicated to implement, right? So you know, I've got this multiple steps of Gaussian stuff, non-maximum suppression. And so if you have an embedded device, you may not be enthusiastic about implementing the whole candy edge cycle. You may just go for a LOG or a Sobel or whatever because it's easier, right? So there's always those kinds of trade-offs. OK, so any questions about any of this stuff? All right, so then I will close this guy up and let's just talk about the exam for a second.